before getting my green tree python Attenborough just up here, I did around about 12 months worth of research and I decided to ignore the majority of it. And it worked. The amount of people that said, no, you can't do this, no, you can't do that. And it's worked. It's perfect. My knowledge of lighting, heating, naturalistic enclosures, naturalistic heating and lighting in nature has been all put together inside this enclosure and it has worked. Now let me quickly explain. While doing my 12 months worth of research, I spoke to, I started speaking to around about seven or eight different green tree python breeders because they're normally your first point of call when you go in to sort of ask them questions and stuff like that. Now at the start, I was a complete novice. I didn't really know much at all. So they were a great source of information. Now they all sort of come back with exactly the same information as each other. So that's gotta be right, hasn't it? Well, no, I found out that like one person would breed a green tree python and I'd say, well, can I go bioactive? Can I do this and can I do that? No, no, you can't do that. That's not how things are done. Well, can I not do the heating like this and the heating like that or the lighting like this because it's more natural is what they would naturally see in the world. Oh, you can't do like that. This is how my breeder told me to do it. So you go back to his breeder. You'd ask him the same questions. He'd say, well, no, because that's how my breeder told me to do it. So it seems like for generations and generations and generations of green tree python breeding, Everyone's been doing exactly the same as the first person who actually decided to do it. The whole breeding hobby is sort of stuck in Brian Barchek 2015 sterile container sort of setups. And I don't agree with that. Now that's perfectly okay for the breeder side of things, but when they're passing that information over to the hobby, the pet keeping hobby, it gets a little bit muddled because you're teaching them how to care for the animals like you would in a rack system or a tub system. I was told a two foot by two foot by two foot cube PVC plastic enclosure is perfect. That's what you need. You don't need any substrate, just a piece of damp paper towel. Uh, you stick a fake plant in there if you want. Only stick three horizontal branches at different levels away from the light and the heat. And uh, it gives them their thermal regulation. And I'm sat there thinking, no, no. Give them a natural habitat that they would naturally achieve in the wild. Give them a natural heating, natural lighting now the heating that was something that come across with the breeders as well everyone seemed to say that reptile radiators are the way forward that's old school technology that's old school information and that produces this is where we're getting a bit tricky with the infrared wavelengths a reptile radiator goes on top of the enclosure and emits heat it's going to emit more heat up because heat rises but it does emit heat down it emits infrared wavelengths of infrared c that's not a naturalistic sort of heat. From what I can understand from my research, it's basically like getting blown in the face by a little space heater. Do you know the little room heaters? It's just like that. It's an uncomfortable heat. And again, from various research that I've done, that infrared wavelength doesn't deeply penetrate the animal as comfortably as infrared A through to infrared B. They're the natural wavelengths of infrared that you would get out in the wild. So I can produce that using either a Arcadia deep heat projector or a mega ray infrared heat projector. They're both virtually similar. They both produce exactly the same wavelengths. Why can't I add that into there instead of a reptile radiator and give them a much more naturalistic heat source? So that's what I decided to do. Now, I did take from the breeders and everybody else. They all come up with the same temperatures. They all come up with the same lighting. So I did follow that kind of, kind of. I changed the heating. I went onto an infrared heat projector by mega ray that's working perfectly fine, thermostatically controlled on a dimming thermostat. Works great in there. It's absolutely perfect, not because it's just got the right wavelengths to pass through and deeply penetrate him and heat him up absolutely really naturalistic, but it's with it being on the top, in the middle of the enclosure, his thermal regulation goes down the enclosure. So if he wants to get away from the light, he can move over to one of the corners. If he wants to get away from the heat, he can move over to one of the corners. If he wants to stay with the light and have the heat, he can go exactly in the middle, just there, which is directly underneath absolutely everything. If he wants to just get away from a bit of the heat but still have the light, he can go to where he is right now. If he wants to get away from the heat and the light completely, he can go down the enclosure. One time I've seen him on that angled bracket just there, and that was when he was coming up to a shed, he just wanted to get close to the humidity that comes off the substrate, and he wanted to sort of get away from all the light, get in the darker areas, and that's where he coiled up. So we've got every opportunity here, all thanks to the heating and the lighting that we do provide for him. But the lighting, 
Oh, the lighting. I was always told, uh, only by a couple of breeders actually, it seems to be a case where a lot of breeders don't use UV lighting and even some pet keepers don't use UV lighting for green tree pythons. I, however, do. I highly promote using it. If the animal's got access to it in, the, in nature, in the wild, then it's then got a need, a want and a defence built into that animal to help it in the wild. So I'm going to use it, but I didn't use an Arca uh, Arcadia Shade Dweller with the minimalistic amount of UV penetration, with the minimalistic amount of UV. I went a bit further. We're lucky here at Northern Exotics because we do have a 6.5 solar meter. I had, let me show you, with my setup, see this wooden thing just up here? Well, that houses all of the heating, all of the lighting just there, and it keeps it away. As you can see, there's the lights flickering. That's the uh, frequency of the light, yeah. We'll get that, that goes into too much detail. There is my UV light. I wanted it over one side of the enclosure so that basically, if he wanted to get out of the actual UV light, he could easily just go over to the other side of the enclosure or go down the enclosure. That will get him out. However, he's always sat either where he is right now or there. This, we'll get onto that slightly further through the video. I can't use an Arcadia Shade Dweller because it wouldn't produce enough UV for him with the distance it needs to go from there to there where it is, plus get through the mesh on the top. The mesh reduces it right by around about 35%. So if we have a look on the chart, green tree python just there, bubble Ferguson zone one, 0 0.7 to 1.4 UVI. If I would have used a shade dweller or any sort of lower Ferguson zone one um, lamp in here, through that distance and that mesh just wouldn't have been enough. So I went on to a Ferguson Zone 2 lamp and uh, we'll see what it does, shall we? This, we are looking for a Ferguson Zone UVI of 0 0.7 to 1.4. Now, I set this whole area up with this branch being the basking area. 0 0.9, get up here, 0 0.4, absolutely perfect. F slightly further away. 0 0.4 so if you wanted to get away from the uv rays you can just go over there quite easily however he's up there at the moment because this is another thing the breeders told me now you only need three perfectly horizontal uh, beams they all have to be virtually the same size they all have to be small enough where he can completely wrap himself around just like he is doing up there i have found he does not use flat horizontal branches perches he's got another one down there which he can use he's got that one just there however the only place he coils up for the entire day is on this kink just here or on that really angled um, branch just there they're the two branches that he loves the most now, granted they are in the good tech uh, good heating zones because they you can see where the heat is just there comes down he loves it there that's his favorite spot so that just myth busted the entire they only need three perches now i did it like that i added all of those different thicknesses of branches all the different waves of branches all the different twists that were in all the branches the different levels the different angles so that i could watch him over the years there seems to be nobody pushing the green tree python pet hobby the breeders are great they can keep their animals and breed their animals how they are doing because it's working but for the pets we need to push the hobby forward a little bit and nobody's really doing it too much. There's a few people out there that have got them in bioactive setups and they're doing really, really well, by the way. I just want to point that out. There is a few doing it really well. I wanted to watch this for a few years, see how he interacts with this environment, and then I can put that information out there and progress it further. Now, a few people have told me because there is so much ventilation in this enclosure. Take, for instance, just on the side here, you can see it from down there all the way up that side piece. There's ventilation up the side. We've got a little bit of ventilation just there and the full top is open topped. Now I was aggressively told, you can't do that. You need to have it completely sealed off at the top, completely sealed off down the sides with just some small vents. The humidity needs to stay in there. And I just sat there and no, if you seal it off like these two foot by two foot squares that you're, gonna, you're educating me to have, then it's going to be stagnant air inside there. Stagnant air is what is the one of the main causes to a respiratory infection. It's the toxicity that's within that air. That's sort of the bacteria are just growing. They get into the respiratory system of the animals, and that's the main cause of respiratory infections. I weren't going to do that. 
I wanted a naturalistic enclosure, so I was going to leave all that space open. Granted, all the side panels of this enclosure, the back panel and the side over there, is a full background build. If you want to see how I built this enclosure, I'll leave a card just up there now. And I was told, if he doesn't shed on his first time, he's going to die eventually. And my response was, well, if he doesn't shed first time, I can always block off the top. I will find a material where the UV rays can penetrate through it and the heat can penetrate through it and I can adjust it accordingly. Guess what guys? He shed perfectly. Absolutely perfectly. Granted, we do have the GoV um, hydro, hydro thermometer in there. So what that is, that's an app on your phone. You've, I've got a device in there. I'll, sh I'll show you. It's, it's not the prettiest device. But can you see that white block down there? Well, that's the GoV app. It connects to my phone. Wherever I am, I can just turn it on and I can check the, what the humidity is, what the uh, temperature is. I can check all that sort of stuff and uh, I can adjust it accordingly. Granted, it hasn't needed any adjustment so far. We do have a fog system rigged up just there, just for that little burst of fog, uh, just at night time, just as it's getting dark and then early in the morning, just that morning dew effect. And that seems to help him quite well. How does he know that there's a morning and a night routine? Because we don't want the lights to just flick on and flick off because that's sort of an unexpected, oh, look, it's night time now. I better start getting ready f uh, for waking up and whatever like that. Well, we'll go back up here again. We have got the Reptile Systems New Dawn Plank Grow LED light there. We've got another one over there and we've got the UV light here. So we actually have three light sources here. As you can tell by this mess here, everything is all set on timers. So the first thing in the morning, knowing full well that he sleeps on this side of the enclosure, first thing in the morning, that one turns on half an hour later that one turns on and another half an hour later this one turns on and then that slowly over the next hour reaches its peak on the uv rays so normally by the time the second one's on he knows it's time to sort of start coiling up get into bed start sleeping the sun's coming up sort of thing and we do exactly the same at night time as well however at night time we do it slightly in reverse because one of the researches we did by using the solar meter was quite simply we went out into nature and saw the uv decrease as the sun sets so we now leave the so we leave the uv light on through um that's the last one to go off basically so first off this one will go off then that one goes off half an hour later and then this goes off slowly reducing the uv and the lighting that goes into this enclosure so he knows when it's going to be daylight and when it's going to be night time with a slow progressive warning now couple this now with the infrared light the infrared heat so that's the infrared heat projector the uv light which is absolutely perfectly correct for that species the right wavelengths of heat the right wavelengths of light the extra space the humidity is absolutely perfect and that i've known this animal for two years I've seen this animal grow up over the last few years. I have never seen him this bright. I have never seen all that colour that's in his eyes. His eyes are just glowing at the moment. They're absolutely amazing. The colour that's in them is absolutely amazing. I have never seen this animal so active and I've never seen a feeding response that like this animal has on him. Now, granted, it's not all good and, oh, look, this is perfect. I found a new way of doing everything. No, 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 no. We have had a problem in here. Wow, no, no, no. We have two problems in here. Now, I'm going to be extremely open here. This is something that I wasn't really going to put out over YouTube. But we have had a few problems. One problem is the plants. Granted, he did absolutely destroy the plants. If you've seen, just before we put him in there, we let it grow in for around about two months. And uh, it was all bushy weeping Jews over there. The bromeliads everywhere. He's, he does destroy them. But they are sort of... Let's get it open and have a look. They are doing okay, but he has destroyed a few. That one looks a bit worse for wear. That one's a bit folded over. So is that one. They're doing okay down there. But there's uh, two that have gone down there. Weeping Jews have been cut off and they've been dumped down there. Granted, the cleanup crew are attacking that quite nicely. And we're leaving it down there to create that microbiotic ecosystem that's going to be down there it is all starting to come back quite nicely but it's nowhere near what it was so he doesn't like plants well no he doesn't know he's a big bodied animal and he goes through there over there which take on his way out he just tears up some plants and it does that sort of stuff he leans on this plant as you can tell uh, it should be like that but he sort of leans on it and pushes it down and it just sort of flops so um 
I am finding more sturdier plants. They will be going in there eventually. Problem number two we have is here in Northern Exotics, we take in a few animals, rehabilitate them, and um, basically find them a forever home. We don't do it a lot. We only do like four or five animals a year. That's all we can do. But we did take in a Royal Python, put it down there. He lasted here for all of three days before we noticed he had really bad mite system. And we ended up with mites in this enclosure. Granted, I just dropped some Taurus in there and they demolished it and he's absolutely perfectly fine. Now he's mite free, along with all the other animals. Hello, mate. But yeah, there he is. He's shed absolutely perfectly fine. Look at that. Absolute perfect. Two eye caps, we've got the nasal cavities, everything. It just works absolutely perfect. I've seen how active he is and I kind of feel a bit bad that he's only in a two foot by two foot by four foot tall enclosure. I kind of want to give him double the space width wise because he does use all the space. Now we can't take the credit for doing all of this uh, just off a whim. We actually spoke to a few contacts that we've got at the zoos and the zoos do a similar sort of setup for the, both their emerald tree boas and their green tree pythons. And they do it this way or slightly different. They do it on, on a much more grander scale, but with the right UVI, the right wavelength of infrared uh, heat, the right live plant yeah i took a lot of inspiration from my contacts in a zoo and um, that's what gave me the confidence to push now you may see stuff like this this is our spray nozzle we don't use it it's never been used it got put up there and just sort of left there because we don't want to create we don't want to take it out and leave a few holes up there so it's sort of just there and plus he likes to uh, lean off this branch here lean on that and come over this way a little bit more so we just sort of left it there but we don't actually use it we physically get in there and interact with him and when we're spraying it down and he's just he's absolutely thriving i cannot wait for the years of watching him and progressing his enclosure to better suit him i do want to give him a bigger one though just like with everything here at northern exotics we just want to provide a bigger enclosure and more space for all the animals that we do have thanks for watching it guys peace out